Hello, everybody. <laughs> Thank you very much for coming. This is Friday and raining, and it's very hard to come here. But it's such an auspicious day. By the way, it's New Year. It's the year of the dog. Uh, and uh, I want to welcome everybody to this uh, special event. By the way, my name is Jiang Wu. I'm the director for a center of, for Buddhist studies here on campus. Uh, it's how exciting to have a center for Buddhist studies here. So we're uh, only less than one year old. It was approved actually last year in July. So we're still in the process of building our program. But we have this lecture series we call the Pui Lecture Series uh, established for this semester. We already had uh, two previous successful lectures. And today we have Norman Fisher as our first speaker. And the Pui, we call this Pui Lecture Series, has been sponsored by a Buddhist organization in China. Uh, and first started in 1991 in Fujian province. So the organization is so generous to help us to start this lecture series. So right now, I want to turn to my colleague, uh, Benjamin Johnson, to introduce our distinguished guest. Please welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chang. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, it's a, an especially auspicious occasion because not just as the Chinese New Year, but also because of the continuing merger of Western and uh, Asian traditions that I see taking place in the United States. I never lose an opportunity to say what I think a lot of people don't realize, which is that um, every American is a Buddhist, really, whether you realize it or not, because um, Emerson, who really created the American imagination, uh, uh, went to Germany and to the youth, read a lot of Hindu and Asian texts that were circulating in Germany, in Germany, brought them back to uh, the United States. If you go to his um, studio, his library in Concord, Massachusetts, over two thirds of the books on the shelves are uh, Asian texts of one sort or another, Buddhist or Hindu texts. He wrote a letter to a friend and said, everywhere I use the word he said, B U D H, Bud. Uh, everywhere I use the word God, I would prefer to use the word B U D H, Bud, but I can't do that because of you know, the ramifications of that. He, in turn, um, uh, commissioned Thoreau to translate the Bhagavad Gita. Uh, he was enormously influential with both um, Emily Dickinson, who knew him well, because of his Dickinson, Dickinson house often and with Walt Whitman, um, and anybody, if you're familiar with Buddhist philosophy, you see immediately how it manifests itself in those uh, writers' works. Um, but there is the other tradition, as I'm always fond of saying, on the East Coast, we have two coasts in this country, and the other one faces toward Asia. And there is that, that steady stream, beginning with the Asian immigrants, uh, of coming to California, and that ultimately manifests itself um, in um, the San Francisco Zen Center, which is what um, Norman is going to talk about today. I first met Norman in uh, 1996. Um, Thomas Merton, the great um, Trappist monk and mystic writer, had gone to Asia to meet the Dalai Lama at um, Dharamsala in 1968. And um, uh, 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 the Dalai Lama promised Thomas Merton that he would come to Gethsemane in rural Kentucky which is near where I grew up, and I'm, I'm very familiar with uh, the Abbey of this. Um, uh, two weeks later, Merton died in uh, Thailand, uh, uh, but the Dalai Lama ultimately fulfilled his promise coming to um, the United States in 1996 for what was called the Gethsemane Encounter, uh, which was a convocation of um, Buddhist and Christian and Hindu uh, monks, Jewish contemplatives, that all came together at Gethsemane to talk about um, the status and the future of the contemplative life uh, worldwide. Um, so that's just a, a little bit of personal anecdote. Um, uh, I, 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 I have questions which I would love to ask, and I'm going to wait until our Q&A period and let other people have an opportunity. Uh, before that, I want to um, point out, if you don't know already, that Norman will be reading tonight, reading and speaking tonight, uh, all the public.
the Free Apology Center at 7 p.m. Uh, so feel free to come. His books will be for sale there. He is a poet, essayist, translator. Uh, there will be representative books of all of those. I, I teach a course here called um, Literature of the Contemplative Life, and I have often taught of uh, um, Norman's prose titles, and uh, I, I, it's hard for me to choose among them because um, they are all in um, some way or another certainly relevant to the subject, but my students, it's almost invariably the case that my students um, respond to those books um, best of all of the books that I teach in the course of the semester they like them the most. Um, I'll say as well about Norman's um, life story, he will tell some of that as part of the history of the Zen Center, but another of uh, the, the two, two um, aspects of his career, if you can call it that, his life in the contemplative life, um, have, have been that um, he has been instrumental in uh, uh, elevating the place and creating a place for women in the Buddhist tradition. Um, I would love to hear him speak. After that is certainly integrally intertwined with the history of San Francisco Zen Center. So I hope you'll speak to that. When I met him, he was co abbot with Blanche Hartman uh, of the uh, San Francisco, uh, I think, unprecedented arrangement. Yeah, there had never been co abbots before. No, there had. There had, okay. Um, in any case, he has been instrumental in, uh, in the role in, in, in bringing attention to, also in his scholarship in um, drawing attention to the role of women in, um, uh, across the history of Asian traditions. And in later years, I would say, probably throughout, but certainly more particularly in later years, acting as a bridge between um, Jewish contemporary traditions and Asian contemporary traditions. So he represents a wonderful um, syncretism of the contemplative life in both um, Western and Asian traditions, and in that sense, is it seems to me a very um, model epitome of um, what it is that in the ideal could happen um, in this uh, in in uh, in the Americas. Um, so, uh, with that as an introduction, it's a pleasure to introduce my friend and teacher, Norman. Can you hear my voice okay? Yeah. Let me know if you can. Just wave in the back. I will try to uh, keep my voice high enough so you can hear me. I'm really happy to be here. I didn't know you had a Buddhist studies department, and I'm pretty thrilled about that. There's nothing more fun than studying Buddhist books. If you can get somebody to help you study them in Chinese, you're in good shape. So this is great. I'm very happy to be here. And I'm also quite grateful to Fenton for, uh, you'd think it would be easy enough to show up and give you know, a talk here and talk there, you know, but, uh, and it is easy enough to do that. What's much more difficult is to uh, send out numerous emails, phone calls, conversations with people all over the university. Would you sponsor this? Could we do that? Can we organize this? This is the really hard part. And uh, Fenton has done a lot of work, and I really appreciate it. I really appreciate that. And there's no reason for it whatsoever other than a friendship and affection. So I really Um, and a, a lot of what I was going to say, actually, you already said. But, <laughs> <laughs> uh, the history of the San Francisco Zen Center probably starts with Anderson and Thoreau and Whitman, you know, for sure. But uh, so I, I, I'll talk a little bit, say a few things that I hope uh, are worth hearing, and then uh, hopefully we'll have most of the time for conversation. So uh, actually the San Francisco Zen Center most distinctly started in 1959 when uh, Shumiyo Suzuki moved from his temple in Yaizu, Japan to, be, to accept an appointment 
as a temporary appointment as the um, spiritual leader of Sokoji Temple, which was a uh, building that was located in a former synagogue in San Francisco, uh, and that, that was a, a location for the Japanese American community to practice Soto Zen Buddhism in San Francisco. Soto Zen Buddhism is the large, it's the largest of the Japanese Zen uh, sects of Japanese Zen sects, not the largest religion in Japan, but the largest Japanese Zen sect. And most of the people who are adherents to Soto Zen Buddhism do not do the meditation practice about monastics. They're householders who, whose uh, mostly their relationship to Soto Zen is for memorial services and uh, family observances and, and this sort of thing. So there's a large Japanese American community in San Francisco. As Fenton said, San Francisco's facing in Asia. So it's always, for a long time, had a large Japanese American community, a large Chinese American community. Japan, Chinatown, San Francisco is very large and developed and has a long and noble history. So that community needed a, a priest, and they were always from Japan, sent somebody, and they sent Shunryu. The thing that was surprising is that this was not a good appointment for him. This was not something that he would have ordinarily done, because his temple in Yaizu, while it was not a giant, important, high-profile place, it was a place that had a number of uh, sub-temples under it, smaller sub-temples under it. So it was a kind of relatively sort of medium-sized kind of hierarchical place. But definitely to go to the land of the barbarians and accept this appointment in the Japanese-American community there was, was not a step up. It was, a, it was a, an odd thing for somebody in his position to do. And he probably had to talk people into, do you want to do that? Yes, yes, I want to do this. Why do you want to do it? Well, the reason he wanted to do it is because he was from, he was born in 1904, and he was from a generation of Japanese Soto Zen people who were really interested in the West, were really forward-looking, and were a little frustrated with the state of Zen in Japan, and, and thought that the possibilities for Zen were uh, not being really utilized in Japan, and that maybe Maybe, who knows what would happen if you went to the West. Let's see. So he was really interested in that. He studied English uh, you know, for a long time. Very interested in, not only in America, but in the phenomenon of religion in general. So he had studied world religions, and you know, he really wanted to see, expand his horizon. So that's why, that's why he went there. And uh, although the people in the community there were not particularly interested in actually doing Zen meditation, uh, they didn't do it. it was, in fact, uh, the conventional wisdom in, among lay people in Japanese Soto Zen is that doing Zen meditation is so difficult, so profound, so austere, that a regular person would never even dream of doing it. Only serious, serious, hardcore monastics would ever dream of doing this. So the idea that they would do it but just didn't occur to them. But there were all these young people in San Francisco then, and sort of he said, well, anybody who wants to come and sit with me can come and sit with me. And so they, these young people who were not members of the Japanese American community uh, showed up and started sitting with him in that location. And little by little, there was more and more and more of them until by 1962, the San Francisco Zen Center was incorporated as a separate organization. And to everyone's great astonishment, Suzuki Shinryu gave up not only the position as the head uh, abbot, the head teacher, uh, the priest of Sakoji Temple, but also turned over the um, running of his monastery, in, of his temple in Japan, to his son, who was then and was still in his 20s, and settled in America to take care of this burgeoning group of weird, hippie, young Americans who were really interested in what, what he had to offer. So that's how the Zen Center started. Now, it just so happened that, you know, it's 1959, 1960, 1961, the 60s, 
where basically went off like a bomb. Some of you, I think, see were around in those days and know what that was like. It was really a quite a cultural moment in the 1960s. Everything was either, depending on your point of view, falling apart or emerging new. And so uh, he arrived in this sort of cultural moment that was erupting all around him. So it resulted in a huge number of people in a very short amount of time making serious commitments to do what the average Japanese layperson thought nobody could do, which is to devote themselves to Zen meditation, and many of them full time, uh, many of them making lifetime commitments to be ordained as priests and so on to do this. So there was a real explosion in the size of the Zen Center all, all, all of a sudden. By uh, 1967, only five years later, uh, major property was purchased in the St. Louis Padres National Forest to start the first Zen Buddhist monastery outside of Asia. Uh, in 1970, a large building was purchased in San Francisco to house the Zen Center. Building that had room for something like 60 people to live in. Uh, by 1971, there was a purchase of a farm in Marin County, which became, became Blue Farm, which was a, literally a working farm and a Zen community, a semi monastic Zen community. And there were about 60 or 70 people full time living in all these places, and many people coming from the outside to access programs. So uh, this was. You know, how did this happen? How did that happen all of a sudden? It's, it's like a lot of things just coalesced in a moment. It was really unpredictable, unprecedented. But actually it wasn't unpredictable and unprecedented because it had been, this had been building up for over a hundred years because it was true that that, I mean, I think Emerson, Thoreau, and Whitman were very self-consciously uh, American. You know, they tended to do on Whitman, so you appreciate it. Right? He, the, the, the idea was, wow, we had this new culture. We're not Europeans, you know? I mean, yes, we looked at, we, we, you know, we read Greek and Latin, and we looked at that culture, but we're not Europeans, so what is our culture? And there's a lot of self-consciousness around what is American culture. And, and these were people who were kind of trying to define that, and they defined it in the light of Asian texts. And, Asian, and they saw kind of, I mean, for them, the Christianity that they had inherited and they were surrounded by was a kind of narrow, narrow. And they were looking around at this gigantic country that was vast, right? And, and they were saying, no, this doesn't fit us, this doesn't suit us. And so I think somehow or other, whatever they got out of uh, Asian cultures, uh, Buddhism, uh, the Upanishads, Hinduism, uh, to some extent, and certainly later, uh, Confucianism, Taoism, whatever they got out of it, let's just assume that they misunderstood. Of course they did. But they were getting out of it what they needed to make an idea of America that seemed right to them, it was, in their, it was in their bones. So this was all, this was all developing you know, over a long period of time, a hundred years or so of, of thinking about this before the 60s, 1960s came. As early as the uh, 17th century, uh, Christian missionaries were going to Asia begin to convert people, and the, uh, under the theory, which operates still today, unbelievably, that we have a superior culture that we need to export to countries around the world that are in need of our enlightenment. Uh, so, uh, but there were a few missionaries who were smart enough to sort of notice that, oh, would appear that these cultures uh, actually have something going for them. 
it would appear that there's something here that we could be learning from. I, I, it was a message that they would be getting when they were in Japan, let's say, the, the Jesuits in Japan would be feeling that way. But then they would, when they would come back to Rome and report this, they were told, no, that's not really true, even though they, they knew that it was. So in other words, little by little by little, it was dawning on people in various ways that by the 19th century, the British were colonizing India, and, and you know, uh, the sort of pre-modern period was sort of beginning, and the British thought, wow, look at this religion, this Buddhist religion, it's rational, it's psychological, it doesn't have all the sort of objectionable things that our Christianity has, it's not like, you know, against modern, the modern world or science or reason, this is a really good religion, you know? so they, they kind of made Buddhism into something, again, that it wasn't exactly, uh, but it served their purposes, and so they did a lot of translation and a lot of kind of creating a, a very positive spin on Buddhism in, in the Western world. All of that had happened, you know, before the 1960s when Suzuki Roshi uh, showed up. Uh, so, and then in the meantime, in, in that hundred year period between these, the time that uh, Emerson lived and the time that Suzuki Roshi showed up, there had been two important events that we refer to usually as World Wars One and Two, which were shocking, horrific events. I think World War One was like a tremendous cultural crisis in the West because people thought, so this is the result of our fantastic scientific progress and our intelligence, and our, this is what we're doing, this is what we do. We destroy more people than anybody has ever destroyed before on the planet. And, and, and the message to a lot of people was, I mean, in popular general culture, no, but in, in, uh, among people who were more thoughtful about things, there was a kind of real cultural crisis. And, and it was, of course, soon after World War II, which was even worse. And, you know, even though if you picked up the newspaper, you were learning about how wonderful it was, the great victories that we had achieved in those wars, what you weren't reading in the newspaper was the extent to which so many people were deeply traumatized by those, those wars. And all that trauma was underground. It was never above ground. Uh, so, in other words, you have this sort of cultural movement sort of going along, to some extent underground, but forming a culture in America. And then you had like two enormously traumatic events. So, when the whole world was sort of erupted, and America, as we knew it, ended in the 60s. Somebody could have said, oh yeah, we've been waiting for that to happen. It would be about now. Yeah, it would be about now. <laughs> right around the time that the enormous economic prosperity that the Second War brought kind of reached its zenith, right around that time, if you looked at your watch, you would realize, oh, something around that time is going to happen. And, and it happened when uh, American foreign policy continued along its logical uh, uh, trajectory, which led it to a war in Vietnam that was not, they could not bring it to a point of triumphant victory. And so, and, and also uh, the dubiousness of the project of that war became very apparent to many, many people. And so the war, and, and there was, you know, nowadays there is no, we can have all the wars we want, it's not a problem because uh, people are paid to fight those wars and only the people who agree to be paid to fight them will fight them. So the rest of us can say we don't like this war, but we don't mind that much because we don't have to go to it. In that war, you had to go to it, and therefore, uh, you didn't like it even more. You had a stake in it. Not only did you like it, and think it was wrong, you had a stake in it. So that sort of blew apart everything. 
But it was just really a powder keg you know, that blew up what was already going on. And so that's the moment. In that moment, with all of this conversion, this little guy, less than five feet tall, shows up in San Francisco, blinks it on, and says, well, let's see what's going to happen. <laughs> and he starts sitting, zazen with people, and lots and lots of people come, and not only does the Zen Center get established, but it becomes an enormous cultural relevance, because it's viewed as a kind of alternative to normative American way of going about things. <laughs> It's a, it's a community, it's a commune in a way. Uh, it's the antidote to American individualism. Uh, it's espousing uh, peace, uh, not rational foreign policies that lead to wars. Uh, it starts a whole bunch of businesses that are at the vanguard of all kinds of cultural, you know, like, you know uh, California cuisine, baking, uh, organic farming, all this stuff that were that was happening in Fomenti as all the Zen centers involved in all this stuff. And not only that, but the governor of the state of California, who's again the governor of the state of California 30 years later, 40 years later, was a friend of the Zen center because he was a Jesuit, right? So his Jesuit brothers, several hundred years before that, had already figured out that Zen was interesting so he knew that already, and so anyway, it was very, very exciting and wonderful. And between 1971, when Suzuki Roshi died, uh, quite untimely, uh, of stomach cancer, until 1983, the Zen Center just grew and grew and grew and became more and more famous and important and, and well known all over the world. So that even even more than the numbers of people who were involved, its influence was really, really strong. And it supported and fostered you know, all kinds of other Buddhist activity uh, in the United States. One very important decision that Suzuki Shinryu made when he knew that he was dying, in Japan, you know, it's typical for uh, abbots to appoint their own successors and for abbots to serve for life. So he saw that he was going to have to appoint a successor. And he had a lot of, uh, he had brought over a number of different Japanese priests who were very good teachers and very well established in Zen. But he decided uh, not to appoint any of them to be his successor. Why did he do that? Uh, because there was nobody really uh, among his American students that was that really that experience with developing Zen, because he'd only been there, he'd only been practicing Zen for you know, a little more than 10 years. And you know, when it started out, it was very rudimentary. It was only really, the practice was only fairly well developed in the last maybe five or six years of his life. But he decided not to appoint any of the Japanese uh, teachers that were fully capable of taking over for him. And I think, I don't know why, nobody knows why. I think partly I think it's because, um, you know, in Zen there's a big emphasis on family lineage. They were in different lineages. And he had, he had some successors, young Americans who were in his own lineage. That's probably one reason. But I think more important reason was he really wanted to be American. He had his own problems with the Japanese established Soto Zen religion. He didn't really think it was, uh, it was very antiquated and uh, very backward looking. It was really about preserving something ancient and noble in Japanese culture, which was worth preserving, but it wasn't about the liveliness of the tradition for the transformation of lives. And he knew, he felt anyway, that if you passed it on to a Japanese person, there's a chance that it would have been gone in a way that all of so it was in Japan, it was going, in his opinion. So he appointed uh, a young American, 36 years old, who was not very, I mean, a good, uh, a very talented person, really good Zen mind, but clearly a young person not, who was not deeply established in the tradition. But this was Richard Baker, who was so incredibly 
talented on a lot of levels that he could preside over this tremendous growth from 1971 to 1983. But um, in the end, it was too much. It was too much. It was too much for him. Uh, he he really is one of the most talented, intelligent, uh, capable pe people I've ever met, actually. So he did it for something that you wouldn't think anybody could have, would have been able to do. He was the spiritual head of an organization. He had personal students that he had one-on-one -on -one relationships with, many, many hundreds of them. He started all these businesses and so on and so forth, managed all that. I mean, how could he have done all this? And he did it you know, pretty well, pretty effectively. But in the end, it was not attainable. Nobody could sustain it. And he couldn't sustain it either. And he didn't know how to get out of it. So he did what people often do in a case like that. They pour gasoline over themselves and they just set a match and then they blow their lines up, you know, somehow. So that's what he did. Uh, he, he had a love affair that was like the most uh, ridiculous. In other words, if you wanted to pick somebody to have an affair with, that would be guaranteed to be the worst possible person that would make the most possible trouble, you would have picked the person that he picked, you know? So, uh, and then, you know, so it was a big, big crisis, a terrible thing. I was around there at the time. And uh, it caused the entire Zen Center to kind of, kind of collapse, more or less collapse. So that high point kind of deflated considerably. And a lot of people who were, um, had been, you know, priests and had to put positions in the organization and so on and so on, just were like this made. Because, and now in my opinion, they were dismayed because they had what I would say was an unrealistic idea about what it is we were doing and who it was that our habit was. I was fortunate enough to, to, to know him pretty well and not at all be surprised by what happened. Uh, and I didn't, it didn't like shatter my expectations. It was sad and troubling, but it didn't shatter my expectations. Other people had expectations that were shattered, and so they fled. You know? But there were enough of us who were, had a tremendous faith in the practice and a sense of obligation and commitment to continue with the organization that it was not hard to keep going. There were enough of us, right, that we could support each other and we could keep going. So um, uh, we did. We, we survived. We survived that crisis. Now, one one more point I want to make, and then I'll stop. Um, well, two more points. One about Japan. These are about Japan. I, I'm talking about all this stuff in America, right? Now, it's not like there wasn't also stuff going on in Japan, right? That also led to this little guy showing up in San Francisco. So, what was going on in Japan? was that Japan was very aware of the West and took the existence of the West and the powerful West as a challenge. And the first response was, do not let these barbarians get anywhere near here. This country is closed for business. Nobody, got, nobody comes here. So they actually, they actually tried to do that. They did that for quite some time. Japan was not, had no relationship with the West, was uninterested and hostile to any involvement with the West, and was very self-consciously creating uh, Japan as an island and, and, and will remain an island, until um, 1853, when Commodore Perry, against the objection of the Japanese government, simply sailed into the Tokyo Harbor because he had a boat big enough with guns big enough that it could not be resisted. And he said, Japan is open for business. And the Japanese then realized that they could not resist Western power. And so, by golly, we will westernize and we will do it better than they're doing. So then they had the Meiji Restoration in 1868 when they 
And they actually quite self-consciously now try to modernize Japan. And it's a whole interesting story. Uh, and of course, the, what the Japanese were able to do there, the Japanese were incredibly skillful and disciplined people, and in short order, in short order, from, and think about this, from 1868 until 1941, which is just a few minutes, they got to the place where they thought, we are strong enough now to do battle with these guys. And so that's what they did. And, uh, and that didn't go well. And uh, so the defeat of Japan in World War II is like probably the defining moment in the entire history of Japan you know, over the many, many millennia. And uh, that caused them to be rethinking their whole attitude toward the West and who they were and who the West was. And that had a big influence. That whole period, Suzuki Roshi was born in 1904, so. From 19, when he was born, the whole conversation about the West and Japan was a big part of what was happening in Japan and it really had a big influence on his life. So that's one point. Japan was actually just like you know, America was moving toward this Zen in the 60s, Japan was also moving toward an American Zen in the 60s because of its long relationship to the West. The other thing that is important, at least from my point of view, is the fact that there's a unique aspect of Japanese Zen. As you know, Zen is basically Chinese and was exported from China to uh, Japan, uh, Vietnam, and Korea. Although that's not exactly correct, but anyway, sources in China. Uh, but the spin on, on Japanese Zen that was, I think, important for its burgeoning in the West was the fact that in Japan, Japan has a very aesthetic uh, culture, a culture in which Buddhism and no, the, 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 the closeness of um, transience and beauty and the arts is apparent to the Japanese, in Japanese culture. And the advent of Buddhism into that culture only emphasized that all the more. So that uh, in Japanese Zen, there was a tremendous uh, connection to the arts. Uh, it was also true in China, but I think it was developed even further uh, in Japan. So that the average Japanese monastic priest was somebody who would have been highly developed in poetry, in calligraphy, in painting, maybe in pottery. So the, 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 um, the idea that, that in the imaginative arts and spiritual practice were actually one thing, was something that was embedded in Japanese Zen. And that was of great interest when Japanese Zen was exported here. It was the first Buddhism, more or less, to be exported here in, 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 with any power. It sort of struck a moment because there was a cultural, in the arts, a tremendous foment in the 60s like there was in every other field. And so artists, there was a famous, uh, Different Suzuki, UT Suzuki, came to New York and did classes at Columbia University and influenced an entire generation of abstract expressionist artists and, and musicians and, and poets. The beat generation, writers were influenced by that. So, in other words, the fact that Japanese had, had that relationship to the arts was an important element in the whole growth and the history. I, mean, I don't think if, if that element was not present, there might not have been such a uh, interest in cultural relevance in the San Francisco Zen Center. So that's what that's what I wanted to say. I just I have a couple of little Suzuki Roshi stories on that book. From little book to shine one corner of the world. Moments in Suzuki Shinobu. In Dogs on a student repeated something that Suzuki Roshi had said in a lecture. Dogs on is a private meeting. Student came to a private meeting and repeated something that he had said. And he said, no. And the student said, No, but you said it. And he said, When I said it, it was true. <laughs> <laughs> when you said it, it was false. <laughs> There's a brief verse that you always recite. This is another story. A brief verse that's always been recited at the Zen Center. You recite it before you put on your. Case, uh, your, your 
sacrament of Moses. I mean, the sacred Moses. Sacrament. Sacrament. Is that that right? Is that right? Yeah. Great robe of liberation. The great robe of liberation. Feel far beyond form and emptiness. Wherein do his teaching save all beings? So we chant that all the time. And, and we used to chant it in those days in Japanese only, without an English translation. And so nobody knew what it meant. We chanted this thing <laughs> for years. Nobody knows what it means. So one day a student goes to Suzuki Roshi and says, What is that? What does that mean? I go chant every day. And he says, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I guess what he meant was, I, I, you know, my English is not good enough to translate. So then, Katagiri, uh, his assistant teacher, started looking through the drawers. We must have a translation somewhere. And then Suzuki said, no, no, don't look. And he turned to the student and pointed to his heart. And he said, it means love. Somebody at a lecture asked Suzuki Roshi about psychoanalysis. And he said, you think the mind is like a pond, and you throw things in, and they sink to the bottom, like old shoes. And later, maybe they rise to the surface. But actually, there's no such thing as the mind. <laughs> a young woman wearing many strings of beads raised her hand when Suzuki asked her questions. She said, Suzuki Roshi, what is sex? <laughs> Once you say sex, everything is sex, he answered. One evening in the lecture he said, if you're not a Buddhist, you think that there are Buddhists and non-Buddhists. But if you're a Buddhist, you realize that everybody's a Buddhist. Even the bugs. <laughs> During a discussion, someone asked Suzuki Roshi if he ate meat. Yes, I do, he replied. Buddha didn't eat meat, they said. He said, yes, Buddha was a very pious man. <laughs> In the old days, during intense retreats, Hiroshi would encourage us not to change positions while sitting. Never move. He would say, don't move. Don't chicken out. But he would also say, when I say don't move, it doesn't mean you can't move. <laughs> <laughs> so you can see why everybody loved him. And, uh, found him. Uh, I think that, uh, you know, Here's what I here's what I, I think that we all are very demanding of one another. You know? We look at one another and we're always thinking, you know, like, okay, so who are you? Are you worth talking to? Are you important? Are you somebody? Are you not, not that we do this in a gross way, but even in a nice way. We're always sort of scoping each other out, and so. In life, you know, you're always sort of like trying to figure out if you're all right. How am I doing? Is it all right? How do they think I'm doing? You know? You know what I'm saying? This is, very, this is like such a commonplace everyday thing that we don't even notice it. And what I think is that he basically would look at people and he would say to them without saying it, you are doing fine. Just fine. And I think that was a great relief to everybody. And I think it inspired a great love. And it inspired a great sense of uh, camaraderie among the people who love them. And I think, wouldn't we all like to have you know, somebody like that? Wouldn't it be great to have somebody who just thought when they saw us, you are doing just fine. And I'm interested in you, because you're an interesting person. So that was the, that's the great secret of his being who he was. I don't think he thought about doing that, you know, being that way or something like that. I think that was just what happened because he was a sincere Zen person, because he trained in Zen his whole life. I mean, he was ordained when he was 13. So 
his entire life was spent in the tradition. And, uh, so he conveyed that message to everybody. And that really is the sort of why the San Francisco Zen Center became what it is. So, so we survived until 1983, and then after 1983, slowly, by slowly, by slowly, we established ourselves and on a different basis I would say if there's two things that are different now than they were in those days post 1983 and pre-1983 the two things that are different is that we now understand that um, Buddhism including Zen Buddhism is fundamentally an ethical system it's fundamentally about how you live your life in kindness. We didn't understand that as well enough before. Now we understand it much better. That's one thing. And the other thing that we now understand is it's not about individuals. It's not about the charisma of a leader. It can't be about that. That makes no sense in terms of Buddhist teachings. It can only be about our being together living together in our practicing together. It can only be about that. So we so a Zen Center has no and there's many many it used to be that there was one teacher in the Zen Center who was the boss. And now there are many, many teachers at the Zen Center, as Fenton said, equally men and women. And we, we, we are very proud and happy about that. We've had men and women practicing together in the beginning. There was the same sexism in the Zen Center that there was anywhere else in the country. And just like the rest of the country, we've been trying to address that, and I think we've done a really good job right now. We have um, uh, three abbots. Two of them are women. One of them is a gay one. Uh, we are going to uh, kind of change our work in leadership. One abbot will step down, and one of the women will retire, and the next abbot will be a gay man for the first time in this video's incident. So uh, I think that uh, we have been paying a lot of attention to that. And there's lots more details about that, but just to say that. Uh, so that's been a very important part, the, the full inclusion of women, not, not just allowing women to have positions, but to bring in the heart, the, 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 the female heart, so to speak, into the practice has resulted in these two changes that I just mentioned. That we see that it's a path of conduct and that we see that it's a path of togetherness, not charismatic leadership. And so that goes right along with, you know what I mean, that's that's a that's a, a, a expression of including fully, at least as fully as we're able to do it given our limitations as human beings, the feminine into the into the mind, into the practice, into leadership at all levels. So the Zen Center, I think, is in great shape. I'm not, uh, I was telling John, I, I, when I retired in 2000, I thought I should go away and, and leave them alone, you know, because you can have too many leaders around. Mm -hmm. And I thought, besides, you know, uh, it cost them money to support me and all this. And so I went on my own and started another uh, group called um, the Everyday Zen Foundation, which is a family of groups and there it is. Person in Tucson and has a small group here, and have groups all over the place. And uh, there are, I don't know how many groups there are now that come out of the San Francisco Zen Center family groups. I don't know. There are so many all over the world, in Europe and everywhere. I don't even know how many there are. Little ones, big ones, all sizes. So it's all over the world. And there's you know, some kind of organization of groups in the United 